because we have freedom of will, we all have choices. For every step we take, we pass by more and more potential pathways. How do we know where to walk? We can either walk by the flesh or we can walk by the spirit. And when it comes to one another in the body, there are also are many steps pointing each to a new pathway. How do we walk with one another? Do we walk hand in hand or do we walk in conflict? We have free will. What are we going to do with it? In Galatians chapter 6 and Galatians chapter 5 is a section of scripture that has a repetition of the word one another. You know, whenever I do a word study of a word or a phrase, I always look at the first occurrence of it because that is important. But also I've learned that you also look for places where that word may cluster where it may be repeated. And if you find a place where a word is repeated a whole bunch of times, that is also as important as the first usage. And you go through there and you read it because in that context it really discusses that particular concept in detail. And here in Galatians chapter 5 and in chapter 6, is a place where the word one another is repeated seven times. Now, so far, we've covered in Romans 12, 13, and 14, the doctrine section, and then 1 Corinthians 8 talks about the reproof section, and now here in Galatians, we're going to be talking about the correction section for the same behavior, how we walk with one another in the body. And in Galatians chapter 5, and in verse 13, it begins. And once we see what the main point is here, we can see how uh, contextual inference can help us answer some questions. Galatians chapter 5, and in verse 13, it says, For brethren, you've been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. You see how that encapsulizes everything we've read in Romans 12, 13, and 14, and 1 Corinthians 8? For you've been called in liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. So we've seen one another three times already. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are the contrary one to the other. There's another occurrence of it. So that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you are led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. And then it lists all these terrible things. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, the point here is that this is in a place where one another is repeated over and over and over again. These works of the flesh, it's not talking about them being out in the world. They are out there in the world. It's talking about these being in the fellowship. We don't want to have any of these in fellowship. Adultery, fornication, all this stuff. We don't want to have that in fellowship. It's dealing with one another. These are the works of the flesh. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. That's what we want to have in fellowship. We don't want to have the works of the flesh. Now, in your syllabus, I've gone through, I'm not going to take time in teaching right now, but I've gone through and defined all of these things. But one of them, remember envying and strife, those words that really hit against the love that we can have for one another? Um, this word strife in the syllabus, it says, 
It's an ambitious striving to be superior at the expense of anyone or anything, gravitating to leadership at any cost, manipulative, weaving intrigue. That's what we don't want to have. We don't want to have any of that political stuff going on in fellowship. We don't want to be position-minded. We want to be function-oriented. We want to have the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, believing, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. We want to have this in our fellowship, and it's the fruit of the Spirit. We walk by the Spirit. We don't walk by the flesh. We manifest the Spirit. And when you work the things of the Spirit, then you get fruit when you cultivate the things of the Spirit. So the fruit of the Spirit is not the fruit of good works. It's the fruit of manifesting the Spirit. And as the more you manifest the Spirit, the more love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance that you have in your life. Now, we've seen what love is. Joy is having an effervescence or glow. It's to be lit up with light. Peace is having the absence of conflict, being untroubled, having inner tranquility or quietness. Long-suffering is being long on love with people or balanced, long on your equilibrium before becoming angry. It's, a, it's your ability to put up with people's idiosyncrasies, to lovingly deal with difficult situations. That's what long-suffering is. It's a fruit of the Spirit. It's a wonderful fruit of the Spirit. Because we all need it because we're all part of a body. Gentleness. Gentleness is having a soothing goodness, a kindness, a healing touch. Goodness uh, is having a sterling attractiveness, having outstanding moral quality. You always wonder why you get such good jobs. You know, these people that are hiring our believers, they're just so pleased with them. Why? Because they have goodness. They have this sterling attractiveness. It's a fruit of the Spirit. Faith. Now, for faith, since most of these things are nesses, gentleness, goodness, meekness, okay, I'm thinking that faith would be more like faithfulness. It's an aptitude to believe. It's faithfulness, trustworthiness, the quality of having believing. Then meekness. Meekness is being humble, being free from haughty self-sufficiency. It's being teachable, coachable. Temperance is having self-control, able to discipline oneself to achieve goals. See, these are fruit of the Spirit. The more we manifest the Spirit, the more fruit results we get in our lives. And these are just so wonderful. That's what we want to have toward one another in the fellowship. We don't want to cultivate the fruit, you know, the, the works of the flesh. We don't want to have any of those things sprouting out. We don't want to have those traits showing up. We want to have the fruit of the Spirit showing up in our lives. And we have to cultivate the Spirit. We have to perform spiritual things to gain spiritual fruit. So the more we manifest the Spirit, the more fruit of the Spirit that we get in our lives. Keep on reading. Verse 24, And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affliction, afflictions and the lusts. And if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. You see, this whole section, we want to, by love, serve one another. And can you see how vainglory and envying always comes up when it talks about loving one another? Because those are two things that can really gut it. And we want to make sure we don't have that in our fellowship. Now, chapter 6, verse 1, it says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Now, this is really interesting because it's in the context of dealing with one another. If a man be overtaken in a fault, the word overtaken means caught in the act. Okay, it doesn't mean that they, they're into it really deep or something. It means caught in the act. Then it says, ye which are spiritual. Now, what is that talking about? Well, in context, ye which are spiritual are those who are walking by the Spirit. 
those who are manifesting the fruit of the Spirit. It's those people who are walking on the Word. Ye which are spiritual, what do you do? Reprove them? It says restore. Because we're an interdependent body. We have mutual dependencies. We need each other. We just don't kick each other out when someone's weak or when someone makes a mistake. So when you catch someone doing something wrong where you are a witness, you see it. If you're walking by the Spirit, then it's up to you to take care of it. So what do you do? You restore. And that takes time, doesn't it? It just, you just don't reprove and leave them twisting in the wind because it's just not our responsibility to tell them what's wrong and then leave the rest up to them. Jesus Christ one time reproved Peter with a look. Just with a look. So ye which are spiritual, we think God might give you some instructions on how to handle the situation? Yes. Ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness. Considering yourself, it's not like, well, you know, I'm so important because I got it right. I haven't messed around in broken fellowship. (laughs) Well, no, you do it in the spirit of meekness. You understand what I'm saying? Considering yourself. Now, this considering yourself lest you also be tempted, it's it's not logical that you would be tempted in the thing where you're reproving and correcting the other person. Where you would be tempted is in the method by which you do it. If you do so improperly, you do it in meekness. Meekness to receive what? Well, ye which are spiritual, receive with meekness what God's going to tell you to do. So you can restore that person. He'll give you the keys. So you consider yourself, lest you also be tempted. Then it says, bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Well, what's the law of Christ? The law of love. That's why we do this. We bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. But there's something else here that's real interesting and very important to understand. Because later on it says, every man shall bear their own burden. Well, earlier it says, bear ye one another's burdens. And here it says, every man shall bear your own burden. It's real interesting. See, everybody likes it when everything's black and white. It's real nice when it's black and white. It's easy. You don't have to think. You don't have to get involved. But is life black and white? <laughs> Very rarely. Sometimes things are. But many times you've got to think. There's shades of gray. You've got to figure it out. You've got to get involved. It takes love to put on your hip boots and wade in and figure everything out, right? Well, whenever you have something like this where you have two words contrasted like this, it usually means there's a balance somewhere in between. One of the things I noticed that Jesus Christ did when he taught, often he teach both sides of something. And whenever you see that, this is a concept that means there's a gray area in between, and you're just going to have to get involved and walk by the Spirit and figure it out. Well, is that hard? Well, God will give it to you if you love If you love, if you walk in love, you'll have the answer. And so there are some burdens which we can help one another with. And then there are other issues of life that are none of your darn business. (laughs) Okay? Bear ye one another's burdens, but every man shall bear his own burden. So if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness you see him doing something in one of these areas where you can help, get involved and restore him. But there are some situations which are none of your darn business. And what are those situations? Well, back in Genesis, take a look at Genesis chapter 2. Really something to understand this. See, if we're walking in love, then we can get our hands dirty. We can get involved with people and wade in and fellowship and take care of them. Because you know what? If you have somebody like that at your fellowship that you know if you come to fellowship and you have a problem, they're going to help you. They're not going to condemn you. They're going to work with you. Or if you know that you have believers like that where if you make a mistake and they see it, 
they're not going to condemn you. They're going to believe with you to help overcome the situation. Wouldn't you want to be a part of a fellowship like that? Certainly. Well, but then there are other issues that are none of their darn business. And what issues are those? Well, in Genesis chapter 2 and in verse 24, it says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. So if God instituted this where they were supposed to leave their father and mother, the ones who knew the most about them, and start their own family and be one flesh, then who are you and I to intrude into that thinking we can do better? Are we able to do any better? No. I think that the burdens that must, we must bear ourselves are issues dealing with our family. Our family, our finances, our marriage, how we raise children, how we take care of our home. Those are all part of the family, and they're none of your darn business. You understand what I'm saying? Because, man, you can create so much havoc when you intrude into a people's personal affairs. Now, look, if somebody asks you for help, then by all means, get involved. Or if what they're doing is illegal in our society or injurious to others, it'll be messy, but you'll have to get involved then. But there are some situations that are just none of your darn business. <laughs> So, and we learn like in Romans, matters of culture like personal tastes, whether you like art or don't like it, or whether you like stripes or paisleys or both, or your diet, those aren't to be legislated and controlled. We're not talking about micromanagement here of people's lives, because there are some of the things we can help one another with, and that's loving. If you see somebody overtaken in the fall, get involved. Get your hands dirty. Get in there. Wade in there. Help them out. But just don't reprove them and leave them twisting in the wind. Restore. And that takes heart. That takes time. That takes love. But we have that kind of fellowship one with another. Man, we can emerge from the situation stronger than before. But then there are other situations that are none of your darn business. <laughs> Boy, the Word just has all the answers in it. So, this is our relationship with one another. Verse 4, But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself and alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. But him that's taught in the Word fully share unto him that teaches in all good things. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man sows, that shall he reap. For he that sows to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that sows to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap. If we faint not, just keep seeking, just keep working at it. Sometimes it takes a while to restore. Sometimes it does. Well, keep on at it. Don't worry. Don't be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. That's the context of this verse. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men. Sometimes the door is slammed in your face. It says, as you have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. See, this is how we work with one another. This section ha is actually one chapter. I would say that chapter 6 should begin in verse 11 of chapter 6. Because the repetition of one another, one another, one another, all the way through ties it into what I call a first century paragraph. That's one of the techniques I, I shared with you earlier. One of the techniques that they used to set off contexts was bookend repetitions. Here is another method where they repeat a word all the way through and it makes it into a first century paragraph. So now all this stuff fits. So it says, ye which are spiritual restore. So I'm saying if somebody is walking by the flesh, they don't have the right to get involved with someone and restore because they already have some other problems in their life. 
if somebody's walking by the flesh, they don't need to be on some pulpit teaching something. They need to be taking care of their problems so they don't have that problem so that we can walk with one another. Let's take a look now at 1 Corinthians 14. And we'll pick up of spiritual matters now. We're going to get into 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and discuss the manifestations of interpretation and prophecy. Because that's one of the things we're going to do in this class. But before we get there, I needed to cover all this other stuff because the manifestations of interpretation and prophecy are wonderful. And they have a wonderful design to them because they're one body oriented. They point the way for us to go at this stage of our lives where we're ready to flower, we're ready to bloom, we're ready to interact with others and not just be individuals in Christ. Now we're ready to move forward and be part of the body. And what is our role in the body? What do we do? Our major role in the body is to edify one another, and that's what these manifestations do. They point the way towards our proper behavior at this stage in our life. And that God dedicated two whole manifestations of Holy Spirit just for that. What do you think God thinks of us assembling ourselves together? He dedicated two whole manifestations of Holy Spirit just for that. Isn't that something? See, that's the the context, that's the place where we can utilize these manifestations and be decent in an order. You don't interpret or prophesy when you're by yourself. The context for the proper utilization of these is in a fellowship where there are other believers. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And in verse 1, it says, Follow after charity and desire spiritual matters. This picks up from chapter 13, where covet earnestly the best gift, yet I show you a better way. There's two ways to do it. You can covet earnestly the best gift. You can go for it. We all have the ability. But the other way is, the better way is, to walk in love. Because if you walk in love, then it'll be there. It'll just be there. So, it says, follow after charity and desire spiritual matters, but more and more that you may prophesy. For he that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the spirit he speaks mysteries. But he that, speak, he that prophesies speaks unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. He that speaks in an unknown tongue edifies himself, but he that prophesies edifies the church. I would that you all spake with tongues, but rather that you prophesied, for greater is he that prophesies than he that speaks with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. Here in chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians is the only place in the Bible where it talks about the proper usage of the manifestations in a worship service which are speaking in tongues with interpretation and prophecy. And what I'd like to do is show you a chart. It's chart number five. And this has, again, where I've laid out verses one through five with all the connective words. And we can see exactly what it's saying here if we look at these connective words. So, verse one earnestly desire spiritual matters, but, in contrast, rather that you may prophesy. So it's contrasting spiritual matters with prophecy. Why? For he that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not unto men, but unto God. So what is that but there in verse 2 contrasting? It's speaking unto men, and speaking unto God. Why? For no man understands him. How be it, explanation, in the spirit he speaks mysteries. Verse 3. But he that prophesies speaks to men to edification, exhortation, and comfort. So what is the but in verse 3 contrasting? Well, first of all, it's contrasting prophecy with speaking in tongues. But also, 
it's contrasting speaking unto men with speaking unto God. And also it's contrasting speaking mysteries to speaking edification, exhortation, and comfort. You see what's being contrasted there? Isn't that something, how it's all laid out when you look at those words? He that speaks in an unknown tongue edifies himself, but he that prophesies edifies the church. So what is the but in verse 5 contrasting? First of all, it's contrasting speaking in tongues with prophecy, and also it's contrasting edifying yourself with edifying the church. Verse 6, I would that you all spake with tongues, but rather that you prophesy. So what is that but contrasting? Speaking in tongues with prophecy. Why? For greater is he that prophesies than he that speaks with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. Now, this is real interesting because it says greater is he that speaks with tongues than he that prophesies. That's a statement of fact. Except, here's an exception, if he interpret. So, if it's not greater than, what is it? Equal to. So speaking in tongues with interpretation is equal to prophecy. Real simple. <laughs> Isn't that something? And that the church may receive edifying. Now, it's real interesting to see this. Who does the one who interprets speak to? There are, there are some people, for some reason, they've gotten off on this, and they believe that the interpretation is speaking back to God because, the interp- because tongues is speaking to God. The interpretation must be speaking to God as well. But does God need edifying? No. If you look up the word edification, God never needs edifying, does he? No. And because of verse 6, it says that greater is he that prophesies, Okay, well, would you all speak in tongues? But rather you prophesied, for greater is he that prophesies than he that speaks with tongues, except he interpret, that the church may receive edifying. Well, if speaking in tongues with interpretation is equivalent to prophecy, and if speaking in tongues with interpretation edifies the church, then how does speaking in tongues edify the church with, with interpretation? It edifies them with exhortation and comfort, just like prophecy does. You see it? So the connective words solve this whole dilemma of how this all works. Isn't that simple? Isn't that really interesting? You don't need any heavy-duty Greek stuff to see that. All you got to do is just look at the connective words, and it explains itself. Uh, verse 6. Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you? Except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine. You know, and now it's discussing this section in here where the main point is if you're going to speak in tongues out loud in the fellowship, then you need to believe to interpret. That's the whole point here. Verse 9, so likewise ye, except you utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For you shall speak out in the air. And there are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. And now this verse 10 is real interesting. It's important because when you speak in tongues, it's a tongue of men or of angels. It's a real tongue. And none of those is without signification. So speak clearly when you speak in tongues. Speak clearly when you speak the tongues part. Because you know what? You might be in one of those circumstances where there'll be somebody who understood it. I was in one of those circumstances. I know it happened. It's wonderful when it happens. So speak clearly. (laughs) Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaks a foreigner, and he that speaks to me shall be a foreigner unto me. Even so ye therefore, for as much as you are zealous of spiritual matters, seek that you may excel to what? The edifying of the church. That's what we want to excel at. We want to excel at the edifying of the church. Wherefore, 
practical application. Let him that speaks in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. Well, what do you do when you pray? You believe, don't you? Okay. So, wherefore, let him that speaks in an unknown tongue believe that he may interpret. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. It's by freedom of will. That's why in our receiver sessions we have people start and stop speaking in tongues, speak louder and softer, speak slower and faster. Why is that? To show you it's by freedom of will. It's by freedom of will. You speak as the Spirit gives utterance. Now, else when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupies the position of the unlearned say amen at thy giving of thanks, seeing he understands not what thou sayest? For verily thou givest thanks well, but the other is not edified. I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all, yet in the church... I'd rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. So the whole point of this section here in Corinthians is if you're going to speak in tongues in a fellowship, believe to interpret. Otherwise, be quiet. (laughs) Now, verse 22 through 25 is real interesting because... Some people say, well, why did God have two manifestations that do almost the same thing? Why did God have interpretation and prophecy and they do almost the same thing? Well, they do almost the same thing, but there are some distinct differences. Verse 22, tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serves not for them that believe not, but for them that believe. If therefore the whole church be come together in one place and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say you're mad? See, these unbelievers and believeth not, it's real interesting in here, because in verse 22, the word believe not and unbeliever in verse 23 are the word apistos, which means not having been instructed enough to fully believe. But they've got to believe something because they're there in your fellowship, right? And then the the words unlearned in verse 23 and 24 is the Greek word idiotes, which means totally uninstructed, like babes or new people who know very little. So the believeth not knows a little bit more than the Idiotes which don't believe or know anything. So, speaking in tongues with interpretations is for a sign. It's definitely something happening spiritual, right? When you speak in tongues and interpret, and for those people, it's a sign. It does have a definite function in the fellowship. But if you have a fellowship made up of a more mature people, then prophecy is to be um, preferred. Take a look at verse 24 and 25. This here is a snapshot of what happens when the worship manifestations are carried out properly. And it's real interesting. Verse 24, But if all prophesy, and there come in one that believeth not, or one that's unlearned, he's convinced of all, he's judged of all, and thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest, And so falling down in his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. See, this is where we get that these are the manifestations in a worship service. Because there's a portion of every meeting where you have the manifestations, and this is a time for worship. And so what happens when they're done properly, this guy Thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest, and so falling down in his face, he'll worship God and report the gods in you of a truth. You see, there are manifestations in a worship service. Now, the picture here, though, is that when these happen, it says the secrets of his heart are made manifest. Well, who are they made manifest to? That person in their heart. 
That's what that sign is. That's what that stuff is that goes on that just clicks. Because sometimes you got deep stuff in your heart and you just don't know what to do. And all of a sudden someone is prophesying or interpreting and they give that message and it just locks in. It's wonderful. That's what happens when manifestations are utilized believingly. And so falling down in his face, he'll worship God and report that God's in you of a truth. Now, in our culture, people don't express amazement by falling down on their face. But you'll see it written all over their face. And this verse 24 is also interesting and and important to understand. He's convinced of all and judged of all. Well, what does that mean? Well, it's like this happens in their heart. It's not like, you know, you are doing so-and-so wrong. That's not how you manifest interpretation and prophecy. It's not specific like that. But when they speak it, the things click in their hearts, and then they're motivated to take the proper action. So that's what happens when you speak in tongues and interpret and when you prophesy. Verse 26, how is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, every one of you hath a doctrine, every one of you hath a tongue, every one of you hath a revelation, hath an interpretation, let all things be done unto edifying. Now, it's real interesting because originally I thought this verse was derogatory. That all these people, all they had a psalm, they had a doctrine, they had a tongue, they had a revelation, they had an interpretation. And in my mind, God was saying, shut up! doesn't say that. Because this is a fellowship. We all have riches. We all have long suits. We all have things to share. This is a snapshot of a fellowship where it says... Every one of you come together, you have a psalm, they have a doctrine, they have a tongue, they have a revelation, they have an interpretation. He says, let all things be done unto edifying. <laughs> Isn't that something? So when you're coordinating that kind of a fellowship where everyone's working together, it's beautiful. But you make sure things are done unto edifying in that love. Then we get on to the next portion here. Uh, talks about how these work together in verse 27. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most by three, and that by course, or in order, and let one interpret. Now, this let one interpret is real interesting because, first of all, there are certain things that we already know about interpretation. For example, in 1 Corinthians 14, 3, it says, speaketh to men. So there have to be at least three believers present, the speaker and two more. Speaketh to men. Then also, we know from 1 Corinthians 12, 11, that all the manifestations are given to every man. So we all have the ability to speak in tongues, and we all have the ability to interpret. And then from 1 Corinthians 14, 5, it says, He who speaks in tongues is the one who should interpret. Because it says, For greater is he that prophesies than he that speaks with tongues, except he interpret. So right there in 1 Corinthians 14, 5, we already know that the person who speaks in tongues needs to be the one who interprets. Also, 1 Corinthians 14.13, it says, Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. You see that? So again, we see it reinforced that the person who speaks in tongues needs to be the one who interprets. Right? So with that understanding, we can read verse 27. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most by three, two or three people, and that by course, in order, not all at once, not on everybody at the same time, and let one interpret, that let one interpret in light of what we've seen earlier, where the person who speaks in tongues needs to be the one who interprets, this let one interpret is let that one interpret. Let each one interpret. The one who spoke in tongues, they need to be the one who interprets. 
Do you understand? Because otherwise the whole issue of 1 Corinthians 14 is sort of a moot point. Why? What's the point? Unless we believe to interpret. So, when you interpret tongues, the proper place to do it is in a fellowship where there are two or three other believers. You don't do it at home at night in your bedroom by yourself. It's out of order. Speaking in tongues is the only manifestation that you can do all the time and be in order. Whether you're by yourself, you can do it out loud, or when you're with other people, you can do it mentally. You can do it silently. So that's how these work. But, verse 28, if there be no interpreter, and this is in the sense if you lack the will to interpret, then keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. That's how that fits. Let the prophets speak two or three and let the others judge. Now here it's talking about ministries of prophets. Now this is really interesting. How would you like to be in a fellowship that had prophet ministries of prophets? Wouldn't that be wonderful? Well, this is a local fellowship here in Corinth. This is the example. Well, when everyone's firing off doing their ministries, maybe you can get to that point where you have prophets. Wouldn't that be wonderful? To have ministries of prophets at the local level? Wow, that's tremendous. Let the prophet speak two or three, let the others judge. If any be revealed to another that sits by, the first will hold his peace. For you all may prophesy one by one, that all may learn and all may be comforted. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. It's free will. God's not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all the churches of the saints. And then you get down here to verse 40. Let all things be done decently and in order. Verse 39. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy and forbid not to speak in tongues. Just let everything be done decent and in order. Now, how do you interpret well, the manifestation of interpretation of tongues is just like all the rest of the manifestations. It works by free will. You speak as God gives you the words to speak. And it's actually easier to do the normal speech because you don't have to think. <laughs> because with normal speech, if you're going to stand up before a group of people, you got to think. And some of us get kind of nervous in that situation because we want to make sure we say the right stuff, right? It's kind of hard. But you know what? When you stand up to speak in tongues and interpret, God will give you the words, and he won't make a fool out of you. You don't have to think about that. He'll give you the words. And these manifestations are by inspiration. In other words, it's already in you. It's inspiration because the Holy Spirit is part of you. And God will not do it for you. You speak it, and then he gives it to you as you speak it. It's real simple. Take a look at Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. Verse 11, If a son asks bread of any of you that's a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being carnal know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? Is God going to make a fool out of you? No. So you don't have to worry. Take a look at John chapter 16. Right when you're ready to speak, He'll give you the words to speak. Don't have to worry about it. John chapter 16. Here is a wonderful principle. It's how all the manifestations work. John sixteen thirteen, and this is how interpretation works. It says, Howbeit when it, the Spirit of truth, is come, it will guide you into all truth, for it shall not speak of itself, but whatsoever it shall hear, that shall it speak, and it will show you things to come. It shall glorify me, for it shall receive of mine and show it unto you. That's how the, all the manifestations work. God teaches his spirit in you, which is your Holy Spirit, and it's part of you, and then your spirit teaches your mind. And then as you act with believing, it's manifested. In other words, as you exercise it, 
God energizes it. And the only way that you can learn how to trust God in this category is to do it. <laughs> and as you do so, you will learn how he works with you. And this trust is fundamental to working all the rest of the manifestations. I'd like to give you a, a definition of the manifestation of interpretation of tongues. The manifestation of the interpretation of tongues is the inspired speaking forth of a message from or for God in your language, giving the essence of the meaning of that which you have just spoken in tongues, which will build up the believers present by encouraging them and comforting them. Now, it's a message from God or for God. From God would be in the first person, I, the Lord, by God. For God would be in the third person, the Lord, He is. Both are genuine. And it gives the essence of the meaning. It's not a translation. It gives the essence of the meaning. I remember one time in the early 80s, I was in LaGrange, Illinois, and a ambassador from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, stood up to speak in tongues and interpret. And I was sitting there, my wife was sitting beside me, and a Hebrew scholar from the University of Chicago was sitting beside her. And this guy started to speak in tongues, and then he was going to interpret. And as he spoke in tongues, my wife's eyes got real big, because she was studying Aramaic at the University of Chicago at that time. And she was understanding the words that this guy was saying. And so then, the guy sitting beside her, the Hebrew scholar at the University of Chicago, he was sort of, you know, like when you, when you hear the speaking in tongues, you don't expect to understand it. So his mind was not really clicked into listening to it. He was ready to listen to the interpretation. But then when he saw her all excited and she nudged him, all of a sudden his eyes got real big because he understood every word that this guy said. It was perfect Hebrew. The dialect was perfect. The enunciation, the guttural stuff was perfect because Hebrew is a guttural language. It was just perfect. And then the guy gave the interpretation and it was the sum and substance of what he had just spoken in tongues. And they're all excited. They're sitting there waiting for an opportunity to tell somebody about because then, you know, the meeting went on. And so then at the break, they went up and told the, the teacher what had just happened. And so then he, the teacher, got the ambassador and my wife and the Hebrew scholar up in the front. And he told everybody what had just happened. This stuff is real. Yeah. But it gives the interpretation. It's not a literal word-for-word -word translation. It gives the interpretation of what was just spoken. And what does it do? It builds up the believers by encouraging them and comforting them. Now, when the worship manifestations are carried out in the believers' meeting, they need to be done decently and in order. And so the guideline for interpretation is by two, or at the most by three. Now, when it says decent and in order, it implies for the order that someone's going to be in charge so that order is maintained, right? Right? So whoever is in charge of that fellowship, they're the ones who decide how it should be run. And sometimes when people speak in tongues and interpret and prophesy, the person in charge will say, well, those who want to manifest, please stand and manifest. Or uh, that he may call on them or she may call on them. Whatever is decided, just so it's done decent and in order, is fine. It's up to the person that's in charge of the meeting. But it says the guideline is by two or at the most by three. In other words, it's unusual if the interpretation is just one person or four or five. It's unusual. Whoever's in charge better have a good reason for doing so. I'm not saying it can't be done, but you need to have a good reason. You just don't do it just for the sake of doing it. <laughs> so... Whoever's in charge needs to call on people, or they may simply ask for those who are inspired to stand and speak. Now, how do you interpret? The keys to interpretation are here on the chart number six. So the first key is free will. Everything, all the manifestations work with free will. We exercise, and then God energizes. God is not going to interpret for you. 
It's just like speaking in tongues. You move your mouth, your lips, your tongue. You do it. You provide the mechanics of speech. It's just that the content comes from God. The second key is love. Why are we doing this? To show off? No. We're doing this because we love God and we love each other. And what's really neat is that in the receiver's guide that goes along with this syllabus in the appendix, in the receiver's sessions, what I try to do is have everyone speak in tongues for the person who's manifesting. So then when you're there and you're manifesting, you know that everybody's praying for you. So the second key is love. We're doing this because we love And when you love, perfect love casts out fear. When you decide, I'm going to go ahead and do this because I know God will be there, I know everybody's pulling for me, then all that fear just melts away. And that's why we're doing it. We're doing it in love. The third key is God is faithful. God's faithful. You will always have the first word of the interpretation on the tip of your tongue when you're ready to speak it. God is faithful. I guarantee it 100% of the time. All you have to do is speak it, and the rest will come. God's not going to give you the entire interpretation all at once. What happens is you speak in tongues for a period of time, and then when you come to that point where you're ready to stop, then right then, right then, right on the tip of your tongue, the first word will be there, God is faithful. I guarantee it. So just speak the word. Whatever word it is, God's not going to make a fool out of you. It'll come out, it'll build people up and encourage them and comfort them. God's faithful, so that's a wonderful key. Just speak that word, and the next word will come, and the message will round itself out. And the next key is the family. We're doing this because we want to edify the body, and everybody else is pulling for you. So if you do mess up, And sometimes we're not virtuosos the first time we do this, right? We need to seek to excel, right? So if you do have a misstep, well, it's the best place to do it, isn't it? Because everybody's pulling for you. Everybody's loving you. They're not going to go, ah, look at you. They're not going to do that. (laughs) They're going to pull for you. They're going to be praying for you. So don't worry about it. And some of us just have a little bit more crust to push up through. Well, who cares? Because if you just keep on seeking, you'll get there. Don't worry. Now, another key is speak rapidly. The first time that you speak in tongues and interpret, the best thing to do is don't breathe in between. Don't speak in tongues and then take a breath and then interpret. Just take a big breath at the beginning, speak in tongues rapidly, and then rapidly give the interpretation. That'll show you how it all works, because the first word will be there, and boom, it'll be done, and wow, you'll be blessed. So don't worry. Next key is don't speak in tongues for a long period of time in your first attempts. You don't have to show off. Just speak in tongues for a period of time, a short period of time, and then give the interpretation. The first word will be there, and it'll round itself out, and that's the last key. The interpretation will always be a complete thought. It'll generally be the same length as the speaking in tongues part. And these things just work together wonderfully. So in these practice sessions or receiver sessions, as I call them, because uh, B.G. Leonard said God's not practicing. (laughs) So that's why I don't call them practice sessions. I call them receiver sessions. Um, It's just a wonderful time of being together. And you just keep at it. I've had circumstances where there have been some difficulties well don't worry about it we need to seek to excel and we just keep at it because you have Christ in you and you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you so just go ahead and do it because when you do it you'll see how it all fits at this time if you have three or more manifesting believers you may have a receiver's session 